Hey, welcome back. And I guess it, we're talking about indicator stands. Um, there are different flavors of indicator stands. Every size, form factor, fine adjustment, you will find what you want. But it's hard to find an indicator stand that doesn't suck. Even the well-praised Noga indicator stands are meh, if you go into detail on them. Um, I have a Noga, a small one, it's a nice indicator stand, but when you want to do a real precise measurement, it gets absolutely annoying. Um, which is the fact with pretty much all of these central locking, uh, 360 degree articulating indicator stands. They're nice, very convenient, and for most of the work, they are pretty good. But once you start to use the fine adjustment here, they suck. The fine adjustment on these is built uh, pretty pretty uh, <laughs> horrendous. The swivel point is back here, the adjustment screw is here, and the measuring point is here. So the lever from here to here is stupid long compared from here to here. So a little bit of movement on the screw moves the end of the indicator here half a meter up or down, uh, which can get quite annoying if you want to set a uh, two thousandths of a millimeter dial test indicator to zero or to a convenient number. Um, and also these um, swivel type fine adjustments here, um, they have side to side slop. They have to have side to side slop, otherwise they would be rigid. Um, there is a pretty heavy spring under it, so most of the time you will not notice the the side-to-side -side wiggle because it gets pushed to one or the other side. But when you move, when you try to indicate something that's moving uh, perpendicular to the uh, fine adjustment, you will see strange effects on your dial test indicator. The measurement will jump if you change the direction, for example. Stuff like that. Also, um, these central locking ones, while they are very um, convenient to adjust, they are not very rigid by themselves. Um, they have this tiny, tiny diameter down here that screws into the magnet. And this is, the fir this, this is a very small cross-section and um, the cross-section of a part determines its stiffness. That and the uh, module, module of elasticity. So you have a very small diameter down here and a relatively large lever, uh, as you can see. And yeah, it's flexible. To make matters worse, they, the, the top surface of the magnet is painted and they put a nice springy washer on top. Doesn't help either. Mr. Robin Ransetti was nice enough to show the indicator stand that he built um, many, many years ago. He showed them on Instagram and also he took took it apart and showed some of the construction details. So I will definitely link um, the Instagram link to those two short videos of him showing the details on the indicator stand down in the description. And I felt that the design of this indicator stand is superior to pretty much anything that FISO or um, uh, yeah, ever anybody else builds. So I ripped them off. Um, I took a close look at this indicator stand and I made a cat drawing. Fired up on shape and drew this up. Which is basically his indicator stand with a few minor touches of mine. But it's his design, so 
I didn't design this guide, I just uh, painted it. Um, I ordered two of these magnets from Noga. Uh, 50 by 50 by 60 millimeter switching magnet, which are, to, a, to my annoyance, also painted on the top side. So, um, why for why would you paint the top surface of a magnet which is used to mount something like a measuring tool or an indicator or whatever you want to mount it rigid and you put paint on the mounting surface eh that's yeah we will surface ground grind this and give this a good surface i also ordered some hardened shafting this is uh, hardened and centerless ground, hardened and chrome plated, I think. Um, case hardened, and the inside is soft, so I was able to drill out the end and tap it M8, so I can oops, screw it on top of the magnet. This is this is a 16 millimeter diameter. Compare it to the FISO stand. <laughs> And you see the difference. The crossbar, the smaller crossbar, will be 12 millimeters, which is still larger diameter than the main column of this indicator stand, and also um, larger cross section than uh, these here. And these are aluminum, which is three times more flexible with the same. Um, cross-section than steel, so you want to go for steel, not for aluminum. So I have these. As a, I just cut them with the angle grinder. Face them off on both ends, which works with a uh, with a sharp carbide insert. You can face the case hardened uh, uh, shafting without a problem. And I drilled and tapped it. It's soft on the inside, so that's not a problem. And next part I want to make is the fine adjustment in front here. Make a drawing here. Um, this is basically Robin's design. Um, we have a long slit down here with a with a hole, with a long hole, a flexure. And the adjustment screw is back here, the flexure is here, and the indicator mounts here. So the the proportions of the lever are to our advantage and not like in this design to our disadvantage. Um, it should be able to hold a normal indicator with an 8mm stem in here. The lower portion will hold the indicator, the upper portion uh, will be rigid. And compared to this design, this has a swivel, but uh, Robin's design has a ball, a ball swivel, a ball joint. So I ordered some 10 millimeter bearing balls, hardened chrome, stall, chrome steel bearing balls. We will hard drill them four millimeters and we will lock tight them onto the end of this uh, fine adjustment mechanism so we can create a proper um, uh, ball joint. The flexure, this fine adjustment will be hardened because hardening the tool steel will increase the, the range of the flexure, otherwise, you will reach the end of the elasticity range and move into plastic deformation and you don't want to um, deform this part um, plastically you want to move it um, you want to be in the elastic range so hardening is what we will do something like uh, 45 to 50 Rockwell C should be fine I have a piece of uh, 10 by 10 2 millimeter tool steel 12767, which I will uh, show. I uh, have the camera upside down. Uh, down here, uh, the, the designation of the steel, so you can look it up what I'm using here. So, 
let's cut this piece of steel to length and uh, yeah, do some machining on it. Removing the Morse Taper 2 adapter in the spindle of my mill so I can use a Morse Taper 4. Uh, call it Chuck. Nice piece on ER25 Morse Taper 4. Call it Chuck. Made in Poland. Really like the, the Bison tooling. Absolutely high quality tooling for a very reasonable pricing. A quick thing about precision ground uh, flat stock or uh, gauge stock or ground tool seal or whatever. Um, it's very parallel ground. Pretty much any uh, pretty much any piece of tool steel that is blanchard ground is nice and parallel. But the stock is anything from square. That means um, while these are parallel and these are parallel, these and these are not square to each other. Um, sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Sometimes you have to take it into account and uh, machine it square. So what I'm doing is I take the, the stock and the Y is very deep. So I I, I clamp on to parallel surfaces on a very large area. And that way, and I clamp it, and I machine over the top surface, the top surface will be automatically square to the side surface. Then I can flip it around and machine the other side parallel to this side that we just squared up, and then we can machine the whole thing to size. Now as we have three sides squared up, we can flip the part around. I change to higher to a higher parallel or taller parallel. And when we clamp it now, we knock it, knock it down on the parallel, we will get we will end up with four square sides. Um, notice that I did not knock down the part in the first setup because the the surface that was resting on the parallel was not square, so might have warped something. Okay, I put the V-block chuck on the lathe and I centered the pieces of material that I prepared earlier. They are machined square to size and to length, and we need a round spigot on the end where the 10 mm bearing ball will get glued onto. So I took my trusty V-block chuck, only one in the world I think, um, put it on the lathe, centered the part, and now we can turn down the square cross section to a 4 mm round spigot. The nice thing about the V-block chuck is that it's very repeatable. Um, can take the part out. Have a copper shim in there so the clamp does not uh, destroy the edge of the part. And I can just clean it out, drop in the next part, add my copper shim and a gauge block in here in the back as a depth stock. Clamp it down and it should be pretty much on center just as the last part. Okay, before I continue on with the indicator holder I'm drilling the bearing balls to go on the end of the spigot here. I already drilled this one. Uh, and it's a, 
a nice tight fit. Um, these are of course <laughs> relatively hard at uh, 65 plus Rockwell C, but even that's not a real problem with a solid carbide drill bit. Um, and a solid, uh, a solid carbide drill will also create very precise diameter and a very good finish on the hole. So uh, let's get this clamped up and drill the second one. I'm clamping the ball between uh, copper and brass shim stock so I don't, do not brinell my white jaws. Um, you never want to clamp something with uh, something like a ball that puts a point load between your hardened jaws of, of your vise. No matter if it's a, a grinding vise or a curved vise or whatever, um, you will leave imprint, an imprint in the jaw. So put something in between. And I happen to like copper and brass shim stock for that purpose. Okay, that's pretty darn good. This is also the beauty of the this indicator clamp because you can use it with the tool and spindle. Solar carbide drill running at 1000 RPM dry. There we go, one hole in a bearing ball. Looks like this. Still needs to be deburred. A normal countersink will of course not cut uh, into a hardened ball bearing. It will be in the other way around. The bearing will cut into the countersink. So we have to use something else. What works very well is for example a, a small grinding a uh, stone in a, in a rotary tool. This happens to be a diamond, but I'm running very slow so I can also grind steel with it without having to fear of burning up the diamond. There we go. Get it deburred. Okay, drilling all the holes and milling the flexture hole. The flexture hole is um, three millimeter wide and it's a slot. Um, in my first plan I had only a hole to create the flexture but Robin uh, recommended to make it a slot to create a beam section with a continuous cross section so we don't get any stress rises in the bent area and that's what I did. Um, we're going to machine this with a long 3mm carbide end mill and the remaining features are only drilling and tapping. Oh, and I pulled out the, the parallels to the sides so the part is only resting on the ends of the parallels so it can drill through. Deep slotting on a manual milling machine takes its time if you don't want to do a shabby job. And in this case, it doesn't look too terrible. So 
It paid off to go only 0.5 millimeters per pass in depth. And you have to be very careful not to, to overrun the end of the slot. So um, either dial indicators or even better a DRO on the milling machine are very helpful for such operations. Okay, I cut the dovetail in the end of the part so it accepts a standard uh, dial test indicator with the uh, five millimeter dovetail. Uh, nice close fit. You have to be careful when you make these dovetails. Um, the tolerances on the indicators on the dovetails that are part of the housing are relatively sloppy. So make it with a little bit of wiggle room. And I tried all my uh, dial test indicators that I have and they all fit so or so, a little bit. Um, over here you can see the cutter I used. I showed this earlier when I built my squareness comparator. This is a single flute, 60 degree dovetail cutter. And I ground it out of a broken carbide end mill. And it works quite well. You have to be very careful as the corner down here is very delicate. So. No heavy cuts, of course, but it works nice in tool steel. Okay, now we're cutting the long slit for the flexure. I did this one already. Um, cut it with a 0.75 millimeter carbide saw blade on the milling machine. Um, and it's already nice and springy, which will even be better when we harden it because we will get um, a larger range of elasticity if it's hardened. So um, the saw blade I have is doesn't cut deep enough so I cut all the way around and then I finish the cut with a handsaw. But the, the machine cut uh, slit gives a good guidance for the uh, handsaw so it doesn't look like crap. <laughs> and the way I do it I'm I laid out the, the cut line uh, with layout blue and a scribed line. And I place a parallel in front of the part. I sight across the parallel until the scribed line is in line with the parallel. Um, you could also do it uh, other ways but I find this method very reliable and very fast and the nice thing is I know that the scribed line is exactly the thickness of my parallel away from the wise so now I can touch off on the top of the parallel with my saw blade drop the saw blade by half its thickness and then my saw blade is exactly on the center line of the saw of the scribed line here. This being a carbide saw blade I can run it quite fast 560 rpm no need for lubrication. Okay, got my Puck miniature hacksaw out. This is a very narrow blade, so it will slip into the 0.75 mm saw curve I produced before. My bigger hacksaw has a 0.85 mm, so I would have to recut the whole slot. That's the reason why I use the Puck. There we go. Okay, I got the indicator holder with the fine adjustment done. As you can see, long slit for the flexure for the fine adjustment. And here is the short slit to clamp either the dial test indicator or a big indicator. Back here, the fine adjustment screw will go and 
I still have to drill out the lower hole and ream it to four millimeter. After I harden these, I will press or glue in a four millimeter bearing ball, which will give a nice hard point contact against the adjustment screw and will make for a very crisp adjustment. I really like the design of this um, adjuster clamp. Um, it has a lot of features built in in a very small package. So, <laughs> um, my head is off to Mr. Ansetti for this design. <clears throat> I think the the fact that the adjustment screw is so far away from the from the actual um, hinge point or flex strip point is a, a big advantage in the ha haptics of this adjustment. Okay, now as the fine adjuster is almost done, I started to machine the, the ball joint itself. The ball joint consists of two clamshell-like parts that clamp around the ball at the end of the fine adjuster here, just like this. Right now, I'm in the process of cutting this slot here, through which the the stem on the end of the fine adjuster can swivel into to allow for a side to side movement. Okay, this is the setup on the milling machine. I have two narrow parallels down in here to give my end mill clearance between them. Uh, gauge block is super glued to the back of the fixed jaw to give me a positive stop. And I'm taking a full slotting cut. 5.5 millimeters deep with uh, a 4 millimeter carbide end mill. I will slot in, move out, and take a 0.25 millimeter cleaner pass all the way around. Okay, here I'm cutting a relief for the center of the ball joint with an 8mm carbide end mill, which I'm just plunging down. This 4 fluid end mill I'm using is really not very well suited for this job. I would prefer a, a 3 fluter, but um, I have not a single 8mm 3 fluid end mill. Most of my end mills are 6 or 10mm, so 8mm is very unusual for me. And I have to make do with what I have here. Here I'm plunging the ball seat for the for the ball with a 10 mm carbide Iskar ball end mill into the part, running relatively slow, 580 RPM and some cutting oil. And I have the lock of the quill slightly tightened so nothing gets out of control. Okay, I have the ball shaped counterbore in each of the clamshell parts and I put them together with a with a spare 10 mm bearing ball in between so the parts are aligned against each other and this makes it very easy to drill and ream the 6 mm hole in the back of these parts. This is the connection to the uh, to the 12 mm rod of the indicator stand later. So let's change our setup. We don't need the super glue step anymore. 
where we can knock it off and clean the remaining super glue with a razor blade. In most cases you don't need acetone or something like that to clean off super glue from ground machine surfaces. A razor blade is all you need. And I really like the super glue work stops. They are fast, you can put them wherever you want and you can make them as low profile as you want. Uh, often I just use a piece of shim stock that I glue to the top of the wise and bump my parts up against or I have a very thin rod in here. Whatever works. But often a massive work stop on the side of the wise with a, a huge rod sticking in just is not the right thing for small work. Okay, we're over the surface grinder. It just saw me filing the radius. I didn't dare to mill the radius because the part is a bit uh, unstable on the end. That I didn't want to risk a catch with a 5mm radius end mill, with a round over end mill. Those run relatively harsh. So I filed the radius. And now we take off 0.5 millimeters off the inside of these parts so they can actually clamp on the ball and the round shaft. <laughs> 